2057, the sun is dying and Earth is freezing. Mankind facing extinction. Seven years ago, astronauts were sent on a mission to restart the sun, but that mission was lost before they even reached the star. Eight international astronauts pilot a colossal stellar bomb aboard the spaceship Icarus II, with the intent of jump-starting the sun and then returning to Earth. They set off on the same mission that was left incomplete by Icarus I. In that spaceship, Dr. Cyril, the ship's doctor, and the psychological officer is facing the sun sitting in an observation room. He is obsessed with the sun and how it looks when staring at it without any type of protection. He is instructing Icarus, a computer that possesses a human language to filter down the observation portal. The sun becomes brighter and Icarus informs that he is observing the sun at 2% brightness. He instructs to show 4% but Icarus warns him that it might damage his eyes and suggests refilter at 3.1% for 30 seconds only. He then refilters it to 3.1%. Wearing his glasses he then sits and the sun gets brighter for 30 seconds. He then takes off his glasses after experiencing the bright sun and gives a smile of satisfaction. Astronauts are seen sitting at the table enjoying their meal and Dr. Cyril is having a conversation. Captain of the ship Kanda informs the crew that the spaceship is already 55 million miles from the Earth and they will be in a dead zone after this and the members should send a message now if they plan to. Robert Kappa, the physicist who operates the massive stellar bomb device, sends an emotional message to his parents that he is out there to save the world and that he is their proud son. Horizon is in the oxygen garden of the spaceship. She is the biologist who takes care of the ship's oxygen garden, plucking vegetables. This oxygen garden grows vegetables in the spaceship which will feed the astronauts throughout their journey. Kappa is still recording his message saying by the time they will receive the message he will be in a dead zone and they won't be able to reply and they don't need to because he already knows what they want to say. And one day if they see the sun shining brighter than usual they will know that they made it. He then sends the message. Corazon is moving inside the spaceship. She enters the room which is too bright with sun, and she instructs Icarus to turn down the brightness. Captain asks if she has got the report for him. She then tells him that the LT productivity is good they are overproducing and it will turn off dramatically if they go near. And they already have oxygen reserves to make it there and a quarter way back and she thinks that lack of oxygen wasn't the reason that Icarus 1 couldn't make it. Kappa and Mace, the engineer in charge of the spaceship technicalities, are seen fighting with each other as Kappa has consumed all the time sending messages and Mace didn't get the chance to. The captain has been informed regarding the dispute by Cassie, who is the space vessel's pilot. Captain calls Mace into his room. He apologizes for losing his track and knows that it's a long journey, and promises to stay on track from now on. Dr. Cyril prescribes him a place where he feels he is on Earth. As he is a psychological doctor he knew how to calm him down, Mace was probably missing home. Mace is seen standing in a lush green place where he feels calm and happy. He takes deep breaths and calms himself down in the open air. He goes into the oxygen garden and apologizes to Kappa for his behavior. Kappa accepts his apology. Dr. Cyril is seen listening to the recorded message of the astronaut from Icarus 1. He is trying to figure out the words of the captain of Icarus 1. Mace is fixing something, and Icarus is giving him a warning that he has 14 minutes to fix the temperature of the tank. Cassie is monitoring the spaceship and she observes something odd. Kanda, the captain of the ship gathers the crew and shows them Mercury passing by the sun. They are all fascinated by it. Harvey, the communications officer, and second in command detects some signs of Icarus 1 and inform the crew. The crew is surprised to know how it survived as it had been seven years. Corazon explains that they can, from the oxygen garden, can still grow vegetables and sufficient enough for three to survive. Trey who is the navigator tell that the ship might have survived due to the shield. They think that they should help the survivors, but Mace is against the decision and suggests that they should not get off track from their mission to save the world and reset the sun. Trey is convinced but Dr. Cyril objects and suggests that they should save their lives, as they were on the same mission and that they will still be able to accomplish their mission of saving the world. The captain leaves the decision to Kappa as he is the physician. Kappa is making his calculations. The captain asks him his decision and he explains that they have just one nuclear bomb and if they get one more from Icarus 1 then they have better chances of a successful mission. But this is totally his assumption and he could be wrong too. But then he finally gives a green signal to the captain. Icarus informs that the slingshot is complete and Icarus 2 leaving the Mercury orbit. Dr. Cyril is seen facing the bright sun again. Kappa is having a nightmare of falling to the surface of the sun and screaming. Cassie confesses having the same dream whenever she shuts her eyes. Kappa suggests she seek Dr. Cyril's help. She further adds that she is there to tell that Kappa made the right decision and she is with him on this, even though Trey and Mace aren't. They all hear the spaceship emergency alarm ringing and run towards the control room, where Trey explains that he made a mistake. Trey calculates and implements a trajectory to intercept Icarus 1, but forgets to realign the shields that protect the ship from the sun, causing damage to four shield panels, which if not repaired could destroy the whole ship and kill the crew. They all get worried but the captain says that they are all still alive. 
they decide to repair the damage. Cassie is helping Kanda and Kappa to dress up and get ready to repair. Kanda and Kappa embark on a spacewalk to make repairs. Assisted by the pilot, Cassie, who angles the damaged portion of the shield away from the sun so they have the shadow to walk. Trey is worried and praying that everything works out well, as he was the one who had put everyone in danger. Kanda and Kappa are seen heading towards the damaged shield, Cassie and Mace controlling and communicating with them, the sun strikes the communication towers. Corazon instructing Kappa to slow down as he was going too fast. The towers are seen sparking. Kanda and Kappa reach the damaged shield and inform the crew that it will take a while but they can fix it. The crew clapped with joy, knowing that the shields can be repaired. While the communication tower is still sparking, Kanda and Kappa are busy fixing them. Mace runs up to Trey and asks him to calm down and that they are almost there. Suddenly Icarus informs that the ship is rotating to its original position and the reflected light also destroys the ship's oxygen garden and oxygen reserves, much to the horror of botanist Corazon. The captain commands Icarus to take control of the ship, as the crew is not able to handle the situation now. Icarus 2's autopilot returns the shield to its original alignment. Corazon reaches the oxygen garden trying to get in but it is sealed. Icarus informs the crew that the sprinkler system is failing, and fire will burn for 6 hours 60% chance of containment failure and a 75% chance to damage to the support system of a spaceship. Everyone is in a panic situation. Mace commands Icarus to open two oxygen tanks to completely destroy the oxygen garden. Corazon is seen crying helplessly. Icarus informs Kanda that 85% sunlight enforcing shield. Kanda orders Kappa to retreat to safety, as he repairs the final panel himself putting himself to danger as the spaceship is still rotating and getting near the sun. Kanda is exposed near to the sun, Dr. Cyril out of curiosity keeps asking what he sees, and Kanda is seen burned to death moments later, but he completes his mission of repairing. At the same time, Icarus informs that the rotation is complete, Kappa survives. Trey is unable to cope with the loss of Kanda, he blames himself for the captain's death. The ship psychiatrist Seer assesses him as a suicide risk and places him under heavy sedation. The shields are intact, but then they don't have much oxygen left now. Harvey who is now the acting captain of the ship decides that without enough oxygen to reach the release point for its explosive payload, Icarus 2 has no choice but to dock with Icarus 1. Corazon says that they can't all reach their new mission and they need to lose three more as they don't have enough oxygen. Cassie fears as she assumes they will not be able to make it back home and die here like the other crew. Kappa assures her that they will be able to accomplish the mission and is not scared at all. Kappa and Cyril are seen standing in the bright room. Cyril's skin is burnt due to exposure to the bright sun, and Icarus informs that Icarus 1 has been intacted with Icarus 2. Kappa, Cyril, Mace, and communications officer Harvey search the vessel, leaving Cassie and Corazon on board Icarus 2 with Trey. They find Icarus 1 dark and full of dust. They disperse to explore the spaceship and instruct each other to stay in contact. They discover the ship system is mostly operational, oxygen garden, water, lush, overgrown. The ship's log contains a rambling message from Pinbacker, its captain, who abandoned his mission and has severe burns on his face. He says that they should not mess with God's decision, if their time has come to die they will. Mace deduces that the transmission was made six and a half years ago, around the time when the crew should have delivered their payload. Kappa informs that the payload is still operational but Harvey explains that despite the ship's systems being mostly operational, including a lush, overgrown, oxygen garden, the mainframe has been sabotaged, rendering delivery of the payload impossible. Trey is still not stable and distressed listening to the current situation. The crew of Icarus-1 is found by Cyril in the solar observation room, burned to death long ago by unfiltered exposure to the sun. Suddenly, the two ships explosively decouple, destroying Icarus-1's outer airlock and stranding the four crew members. With only one spacesuit available, Cassie explains that they will not be able to dock again. Mace finds a spacesuit and Mace helps Kappa to wear it due to being the only crew member able to operate the payload. Harvey disagrees with the decision and orders Kappa to remove the suit. Cyril makes him understand that they have no other choice. He is finally convinced. Mace instructs Cassie to release the air pressure, but they can't enter Icarus 2 without wearing spacesuits. Mace finds a way and the rest wrap themselves in salvaged insulation material that they rip from the walls of the ship and then jettison between airlocks, using the vacuum release for propulsion. Cyril realizes that one of them must stay behind to manually operate the airlock and volunteers himself. Cyril releases the airlock, shooting Kappa, Harvey, and Mace out into open space. Harvey misses the airlock, freezes, and dies from asphyxiation, while Kappa and Mace make it back to Icarus 2. Kappa is fine as he is in a space suit but Mace is freezing. Cyril is informed that Icarus 2 is leaving for the mission. Cyril, having spent the mission obsessed with looking into the shielded sun, voluntarily exposes himself to its full, deadly force in the observation room, killing himself in the process. Mace is seen discussing with the crew how the spaceship got decoupled and finds out that it was decoupled manually. Mace blames Trey but Kappa says he is mostly sleeping and he is not in the position to do this at all. Corazon, 
adds that they have less oxygen and if Trey dies there is the possibility that they can make it to their mission. They all vote to kill Trey so that they can complete their mission to save the world. Cassie gets emotional and votes for nothing. She understands the logic but then tells Mace to be easy on Trey. Mace leaves for the mission to kill Trey, but he finds Trey surrounded by blood and lifeless, he took his own life. He calls everyone and blames Kappa for the death of their crew members. He said it wouldn't have happened if he wouldn't take the wrong decision of saving Icarus 1. They both get into a fight. Later, Kappa is seen making some calculations and is informed by Icarus that there is still not enough oxygen to complete the mission because an unknown fifth person is on board the ship. Icarus informs that the unknown person is in the observation room. Kappa heads towards the observation room where the sun is too bright and he could hardly see. He is only able to see a shadow of a body. Kappa investigates and discovers an insane and disfigured pinbacker who is revealed to have been behind the decoupling of the airlocks. Pinbecker attacks, wounds, and pursues Kappa into the airlock, who seals it from his side. Pinbecker locks his side of the airlock to trap Kappa. He is now on the mission to kill everyone as he believes that the sun is God and that mankind is trying to kill it. After spending so many years alone in Icarus 1 near the sun, he has this insane belief. Pinbecker removes the four mainframes from their coolant baths. Icarus warns that he doesn't have authority to remove main panels and requests to rotate the panels back to the position the temperature reaching its maximum limit. The next scene shows Corazon in the oxygen garden and finds some sign of growth. She seems happy but Pinback attacks her from behind and she falls. Injured Kappa, struggling to inform the rest of the crew members about Pinbacker. Mace is seen walking towards Kappa but suddenly the ship's computer is shut down by Pinbacker. It's dark on the ship. Cassie is Pinbacker's next target. Mace manages to turn on the computer and connect with Kappa. Kappa informs Mace about Pinbacker's mission and Mace leaves to fix the system. Pinbacker chases Cassie. Mace manually lowers two of the computers back into the freezing coolant, but when his leg catches on the third descending mainframe, he becomes trapped. Computer system is disabled. As he freezes to death, he begs Kappa to complete the mission. Kappa blows the airlock and separates the bomb from the ship, which is burned away by the sun. He then enters the bomb, where he finds Cassie, but they are ambushed by Pinbacker, who claims he spent the last seven years conversing with God, the sun, and was told to send all humanity to heaven. As they hurtle into the sun, Kappa escapes Pinbacker by ripping the skin off one of his arms. Cassie encourages Kappa to ignite the bomb, and he manages to reach the controls. Unsure if it will work under these extreme conditions, he watches as the bomb begins to ignite at the edge of the sun, killing Cassie and Pinbacker. As time and space distort, Kappa uses his final moments to blissfully reach out and touch the surface of the sun. On Earth, at the frozen Sydney Harbor, Kappa's sister and her children listen to Kappa's last transmission and witness the sun's light starting to shine again, assuring the accomplished mission of Icarus II.